Okay, so Glenn, great to see you, my friend. You know, the first thing that I just want to bring up is just now, it appears that Trump's attorneys in the New York Attorney General case just filed for a mistrial. Being the legal beagle that you are, tell me, what's what's the story on this? Is this a is this a relatively um, you know expedient move for them? Is this something that is done on a regular basis by defense counsel? What do you know? Yeah, in my 30 years as a trial court prosecutor, I really never did leave the, the courtroom. Um, in most cases, defense attorneys would file motions for a mistrial. The reason they did that is because, look, they thought there was some legal infirmity and in something that had gone on during the proceedings, a bad ruling by the judge, maybe something they discovered with respect to a juror engaging in misconduct. And they want to preserve the issue for appeal. So they will file a motion for a mistrial. In my experience, they are almost always denied. I don't think I had one mistrial granted in my 30 years as a prosecutor that, that the defense filed. So here's one thing I can promise people. Judge N. Loron is the one who is presiding over the case and who will decide whether he has some done something so egregiously wrong or illegal that he has to grant a mistrial based on his own mistake or misconduct. It ain't happening. So this is just one more thing that they will try to raise on appeal. Yeah, because I believe that if you look to see what happened yesterday with Stefanik and Turner filing the request to um, uh, the DOJ, to Merrick Garland, asking for an inquiry to be open into perjury charges. I think that they think that they're going to get the same mistrial that they asked for when they filed for, well, when they made the request for uh, a motion uh, for a directed verdict at the time of the trial based upon allegations that I lied. In fact, I did not lie. That's the craziest thing. And Judge Ngoron was absolutely denied. I've never heard a judge say that, but absolutely denied. But yeah, I guess that's the appealable issue that they think that they have. Am I right? Yeah. It, it, and it will fail on appeal. And look, I saw that letter that was authored saying they want you to be investigated for perjury. And you know, Michael, this is what they do. Um, they really don't care much about the rule of law. They do everything for political advantage. Yep. You know, this is the same Congress, the House of Representatives, that has um, really abused the power of the House of Representatives uh, committees. J Jim Jordan is still out of compliance with a congressional subpoena. Jim Jordan has still yet to be held accountable for criminal contempt of Congress. And yet Jim Jordan is still weaponizing Congress to try to obstruct the criminal investigation into Donald Trump down in Georgia, for which he, Jim Jordan, has yet to be held accountable. I would sure like to see some of the crooks in Congress held accountable for, for example, their participation in the insurrection, particularly the ones that admitted to it by requesting pardons. You only request a pardon when you know you've committed a crime and you want to get away with it. I sure hope DOJ is working behind the scenes to hold the insurrectionists in Congress accountable. So it doesn't surprise me they continue to abuse the power of Congress. Yeah. So look, Glenn, it's been a, obviously it's been a very busy few weeks, my friend. All right. So I got to ask you this. Jack Smith has Trump by the short hairs. No doubt about that. Or as you've said, Smith is weaving evidentiary threads into one treasonous ta uh, tapestry. Would you break down your theory of how Smith will hold Trump accountable for the January 6th insurrection, please? Yeah, so the first thing people should realize is once this case is being tried in court, all of the nonsense that you hear Donald Trump and his lapdogs, lackeys, flunkies, and sycophants spouting out every day, none of that is admissible. So nobody, Michael, will be able to walk into the courtroom, take the stand um, on behalf of Donald Trump and say, Donald Trump believed the election was stolen. That is inadmissible evidence. 
Everything Donald Trump says that incriminates him is admissible evidence when the prosecutors seek to introduce it. It's called the statement of a party opponent. All of the nonsense about declassifying things with his mind and the Presidential Records Act tells me I could take all this stuff. That's not admissible evidence unless Donald Trump takes the stand at his own criminal trial. And if he does, he is even more foolish than we all believe him to be. So when you just look at a handful of the data points, the evidence is overwhelming of Donald Trump's guilt. He, first of all, recruited the insurrectionists. Stand back and stand by, Proud Boys. Mm -hmm. He set the date for the attack. He tweeted out on December 19th, come to D.C., big protest, January 6th, will be wild. He gave them a pre-insurrection pep rally on the ellipse, urging them to fight like hell or you won't have a country anymore. Now go to the Capitol and stop the certification. He said, stop the steal, which is actually helpful because it helps prove his criminal intent because the prosecution will prove it wasn't stolen and he knew it wasn't stolen. And then Michael, while the attack that he ordered raged on, he refused to call it off, even though, even though he knew people were being hurt at the Capitol. And what does he do? He then throws gasoline on the fire by saying Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what needed to be done to keep me in power. And that caused the crowd to erupt in chants of hang Mike Pence, which Donald Trump told others he didn't think they were wrong. He thought Mike Pence was wrong. So he added fuel to the fire rather than trying to calm the folks down at the Capitol. And then what did he do at the end? He pledged love and pardons. That's a little something called giving aid and comfort to the insurrection and the insurrectionists. Michael, there's six data points that when woven together into that one treasonous tapestry, will have a jury in D.C. voting guilty so fast it will make Donald Trump's head spin. If there's anything I know... It is assessing evidence and presenting it to a jury because, you know, I never did want to climb the bureaucratic ladder of success. I wanted to be in a courtroom trying cases. So that's what I did for 30 years. Maybe people would say you didn't have it. You didn't have the ability to climb the bureaucratic ladder of success. I'll cop to that. That's fine. No, I never would have made a good bureaucrat. But you know what? The evidence is so powerful and so overwhelming. And Jack Smith and his team are so appropriately aggressive and fearless, Donald Trump is done. The only impediment to a Donald Trump conviction is getting that jury to start on March 4th, as Judge Chutkin has pledged it will, and then justice is off to the races. Yep. Well, let's not forget, too, you now have Jen Ellis's testimony. You also have Mark Meadows' testimony. You know, a fact about January 6th that's very rarely ever discussed is the fact that the Ellipse rally, which turned into a march, that rally was supposed to be handled by this young lady, Jennifer Lawrence, not the actress, uh, Jennifer Lawrence and her boyfriend. They're the ones that took out the permit for it. But that rally was hijacked by Eric and Lara Trump. And they turned it into a march, which violates, of course, the permit that was issued. But they, I believe they all knew exactly what was going to happen, which, of course, expands upon your, uh, you know, tapestry of treason. That's what I, I truly believe. And it's just not spoken enough on the rally itself, which turned into a march. Yeah, it was it was a pre-insurrection pep rally. Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani and Mo Brooks and John Eastman knew exactly what they were doing when they ginned that crowd up into a violent frenzy and set them on the Capitol. For God's sakes, Rudy Giuliani said, let's go have trial by combat. I mean, come on, folks. Of course, this was criminal start to finish. And it was a Trump production start to finish. And all of these folks ultimately are going to be held accountable. I do think we have a second wave of indictments we are likely to see in Washington, D.C., maybe not until Jack Smith 
gets Donald Trump convicted in the first trial in D.C. But the one thing I am sure of, Jack Smith would not have put in a public indictment, the one he issued against Trump standing alone, Mm -hmm. single defendant indictment. He would not have put in there, hey, everybody, look at these six co-conspirators. He didn't name them, but they were identified in substance. Look at these six co-conspirators. We have evidence that they committed crimes with and in a conspiracy uh, together with Donald Trump. Do you really think he was going to put that in the public record and then say, but you know what? I'm not going to try to hold them accountable for their crimes. There are more indictments coming, I believe, in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm with you on that one. So let me ask you this then, Glenn. Just how damaging is the leaked video footage of the plea deal hearings of Chesbro, Ellis, and Powell in the Fulton County election fraud case? Is it worse for Trump or is it worse for Fannie Willis's RICO case? What's your thoughts? Um, so I'm going to say it's not worse for either. And, and here's why I say it. First of all, Fannie Willis, the evidence suggests, did not leak this. It looks like it was leaked by one of the defendants who received these videotapes as part of the discovery in their case. Um, So it's not like Fannie Willis or her prosecutors did anything wrong. They gave discovery appropriately, and it should have been kept in confidence. Of course, they're now seeking a protective order to make sure there are no further leaks. You know, does it hurt Donald Trump? Maybe in the court of public opinion, to the extent that people who hear it are sort of fact-based people yeah, willing few, to- Few of those, you right? Know, well, that's the problem. No matter how guilty the evidence proves Donald Trump to be, it doesn't seem to penetrate his, his cult, right? Um, but I don't think it's, it's bad for anybody because the evidence is what the evidence is. And it was recorded in those videotaped proffers, which we almost always require a cooperating witness to give before we move forward with a plea deal that includes cooperation, because we don't want to be buying a pig and a poke. We want to know what kind of incriminating information this person can bring to the table before we extend them a plea deal with cooperation. So, but the evidence is what it is. And and the fact that we now know (laughs) <laughs> that Dan Scavino, who, if he is a co-conspirator with Donald Trump, this is some really powerful testimony. Dan Scavino said, the boss said, we ain't leaving. Doesn't matter, win, lose, or draw. We're not relinquishing power. First of all, hearsay um, is a statement that somebody made out of court that the prosecutors want to use in court to prove the truth of the matter asserted, the substance of the statement. So um, Jenna Ellis can't testify. Dan Scavino told me, Donald Trump told him we're not leaving, right? Because that would Mm -hmm. be hearsay. It would be Jenna saying what Dan Scavino said, saying what Trump said, unless, and this is the big unless, and this is why prosecutors love using conspirator liability when the evidence supports it. If Dan Scavino was part of Trump's conspiracy and he used the royal we, he said, we are not leaving, which is some pretty important evidence suggesting Dan Trump and others were in the conspiracy together. Then it becomes a co-conspirator statement that's admissible against all of the co-conspirators. It's an exception to the hearsay rule. So that piece of evidence that we learned from Jenna Ellis is potentially really powerful against not only Dan Scavino, but against Donald Trump too. Yeah, what Dan should have said is Donald said he's not leaving. Well, the boss said he's not leaving. By saying we, he opens himself up to the whole conspiracy. Um, And look, it's not fair to turn around and to (laughs) expect anything great out of Dan Scavino. I mean, you have to understand, Dan Scavino achieved something that I don't think could ever be achieved again in the history of this world. Started out as a golf caddy, became the general manager of Trump National Golf Club in Briarcliff in Westchester, then ultimately was fired, then came back when Trump was running in 2016 to handle his social media for free, and then ultimately went with him, became his social media um, sidekick, 
in D.C. to ultimately become deputy chief of staff. That's a fucking hell of a run for, you know, for a golf caddy. I mean, it's really, truly unbelievable. But the proximity to Trump finally gave the guy a set of balls, and he screwed up by saying, we are not leaving. All of a sudden, it's like, you know, he's part of the inner circle. He's part of that group. And that part of the group is going to create that whole conspiracy theory that you just created, which then, you're right, takes it out of the hearsay rule. And the other thing, Michael, is remember, Dan Scavino, together with Mark Meadows, were referred for prosecution for contempt of Congress because they both criminally defied a congressional subpoena. He has yet to be held accountable for that, just as Mark Meadows has not been held accountable for that. Now, there are lots of indicators that Meadows is cooperating and perhaps has been for some time. We don't know that for sure, but the fact that he was given some limited immunity tells me that he is more likely to be in the cooperation camp than in Donald Trump's camp. But, you know, Dan Scavino got away with contempt of Congress, at least thus far. Let's hope that Jack Smith has bigger charges coming for Dan Scavino. Yep, amen to that. So, Glenn, Sidney Powell has been trying to recoup some of her bad reputation by claiming that she lied during the hearing for her plea deal. Do you think that, that she'll end up being a witness for the defense in the Georgia case? I mean, I've read so much on this. It looks like she really pulled the fast one over Fonnie Willis that she's almost like unusable at this point. And yet she got immunity. She, uh, yeah, she didn't get immunity. She got a plea deal. I apologize. Right? With, You're right. With, a plea deal. Yeah, yeah, with cooperation. Has she rendered herself unusable? Maybe, maybe not. You know, one of the thing, you know, I, I don't think there's any cooperator, whether it's Chesbro or Scott Hall, the bail bonds, bondsman, or Jenna Ellis or Sidney Powell, who was going to run out into the public square after they pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against their co-defendants in Georgia, including Donald Trump, run out into the public square, say, listen up, I can incriminate Donald Trump upside, up one side and down the other. Are Donald Trump supporters listening? Can I give you my address? Do you want to come get after me? Because we know they would be in harm's way. You know it as, as well as anybody living knows it, it Michael. Living you, it. You've lived it. You're living it. So it doesn't surprise me that some of them will do one thing behind closed doors with Fawny Willis and then in court and do another thing in, in the court of public opinion. Does it render her unsponsorable, unusable by the prosecutors? Devil's in the details. It depends on how she explains the statements she made that were inconsistent with her plea in court. Um, I, I think the best compliment everybody, anybody ever paid Sidney Powell when I saw the release of her proffer videotape was that she said, Rudy Giuliani told me he was the worst law lawyer he had seen in his whole life. I'm like, well, that's a compliment, you know, because nobody's crediting Rudy's opinion about anything. Um, now, Rudy, I would say, is an unsponsorable witness. As a prosecutor, former career prosecutor, I would not do business with Rudy Giuliani because there's this phenomenon, Michael, that if a prosecutor puts a witness on the stand who's so irredeemable, who's told so many lies, who's engaged in so much democracy-busting conduct, that if you urge a jury to believe them and convict somebody else based on their word, then the Giuliani stink kind of can rub off on the prosecutors. We lose our credibility. So if it were me, I wouldn't touch Rudy with a 10-foot pole as a cooperating witness. I would simply prosecute him, convict him, and urge the judge to imprison him. Yeah, which is funny because that's exactly what Team Trump, you know, his legal beagles, the D team, uh, are trying to say to both Angoron as well as to uh, Judge Mershon in the Manhattan District Attorney case, that Michael Cohen is this fucking massive liar, right? Yeah, I acknowledged what I had lied to Congress about. The part that bothers me the most is it just doesn't get the traction that Trump's messaging gets. I lied in coordination with Trump's 
entire team. I wasn't Ivanka, Jared, Ty Cobb, um, you know, Abby Lowell. Uh, you know, it, it was, there was um, Jay Seculo. There was a handful of people helping me to write the statement to which I read and put into the record talking about, get a load of this, the failed Trump Tower Moscow real estate project, the number of times that I stated that I spoke to Donald. I said three. Why three? That's what the guy wanted. I was so knee deep into the cult. If he would have said, say one, I would have said one. Why? I didn't give a shit when the true answer was 10. Is it really such a big deal? I mean, is it de minimis? It's a failed project. It had no real relevance. And at the end of the day, that's what I was, that's what I was forced to plead guilty to. That is what I pled guilty to. That's the big lie. And this is what they want to use in order to prevent me from being a credible witness. Can you imagine this shit? Yeah. Well, Listen, it, it, I don't think it gets much worse than when, you know, you have made clear and I think the evidence has made clear that you committed crimes at the direction of and for the benefit of Donald Trump. You got punished and Donald Trump has not seen one flipping minute of accountability for those crimes. That to me, Michael, is a deep injustice that is ongoing to this day. And, you know, I... I have a real beef with the statute of limitations expiring on crimes that Donald Trump committed while he was in office. You know, even Bob Mueller said he can be indicted the day he leaves office. And yet crime after crime after crime that we know he committed while in office, extortion and bribery of President Zelensky, multiple counts of obstruction of justice, obstructing Congress, witness are tampering. being allowed, <laughs> witness tampering, they're being allowed to, to expire one after another. And what that does is it gives the next aspiring dictator free reign to do it all over again. At some point, the rule of law needs to go hard, needs to be asserted by the good men and women uh, uh, in, in our institutions of government or else we're going to give it all away. We're going to give our republic away. And I don't know why it is people are unwilling to suffer the criticism that will come, but follow the facts in the law and charge a criminal former president for the crimes he committed while in office. Yeah. What's going to happen when, God forbid, he becomes, or if he ever became president again? He already tried once in order to figure out how to convert our democracy to an autocracy. And a lot of people that, ah, bullshit, Michael, hyperbole, hyperbole, uh, you know, no, it's not. You know, the two ways that you destroy you know, um, a democracy and turn into an autocracy is you take away people's First Amendment rights. And the second way is you empower, you take over the military. So you create state run news media like the way Russia does right with Pravda which is uh, in Russian it means truth but that's the state run media and of course you control the you control the military well what do you think Donald Trump did when he had me unconstitutionally remanded back to prison because I refused to waive my first amendment constitutional right and you know Glenn to this day we're already 19 months into my request under FOIA, and I have not gotten a single piece of paper yet. They keep coming up, yeah, well, we processed 509 documents, but we're turning over zero. And this is the same fucking letter every goddamn month on the 23rd, 24th goes to my lawyer, Mark Zaid, who turned, and, and he then sends it to me, and it all says the same shit. 509, 510 documents processed, and we're turning over none. And they're turning it over. They're not turning it over because it could uh, injure methods and process, or it could place the life of an agent or a witness in jeopardy for, you know, uh, it's the whole thing is so infuriating because any one of those documents is going to begin the trail of showing exactly what Donald Trump and Bill Barr and the DOJ and the BOP did in order to, again, unconstitutional. They created a document for me to sign that doesn't exist. Nobody else has ever signed that document. And I still can't get 
a single piece, despite the fact Congressman Jamie Raskin, Congressman Dan Goldman, Congressman Steve Cohen, you know, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, Ted Lieu, they've all put in, Senator Dick Durbin, they have all put in requests to find out what's happening, uh, whether it was an IRS action or whether it was the FOIA doc. Nobody is able to get a single response from FOIA. This is crazy. And, and when you have the backing of a federal court judge in New York who granted your petition for a writ of habeas corpus, right? Proving that the federal government, as you say, Bill Barr and Donald Trump, acted illegally, unconstitutionally. Is the word that he used. Exactly. Yeah. You have the backing of a federal judge ruling that way, and yet the government still keeps this shroud of secrecy, you know, concealing the documents that would provide, as you say, the paper trail to how it is Donald Trump and Bill Barr acted unlawfully and unconstitutionally against you. You know, I, I have long been an advocate for transparency in the federal government because the default of the federal government is almost always a lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are some good reasons for that. The one good reason is national security. No, I don't want to damage our national security interests. Sources and methods. I agree. We need to try to keep our sources and methods protected and safe so we continue can, can continue to use them effectively to protect the American people. But when the president and the AG did what they did to you and a federal judge granted your petition for a writ of habeas corpus, that's that's the time the federal government needs to look inward and say, we need to be more forthcoming because this is not how the federal government should be acting. No administration should be acting this way. So, you know, I'm I'm with you on that, Michael. Yeah, you know, I have on December 14th, I'm going before the appellate court because as a result of the uh, Dobbs decision, which not only overturned Roe versus Wade, it also overturned the Bivens case. And so the judge in my specific said, listen, I agree with you wholeheartedly, but Bivens has been neutered as a result of the Dobbs decision. However, there is one line in there that was put in by um, by Justice Thomas that said, unless of the most unusual circumstance that it avoids being kicked out. Well, what could be more unusual than the president of the United States with a willing and complicit bloviated asshole attorney general conspire to violate your First Amendment constitutional right, remand you to prison because you refuse to waive your First Amendment right. What could be? I can't think of anything that would be more unusual than that scenario, which is part of, of course, of our appeal. But this whole thing is just crazy. I certainly hope it gets remanded back because if it does, it gives obviously us the opportunity to get the documents through court, you know, uh, through the discovery process. Which yeah. would be and Donald special. Trump and Bill and Donald Trump and Bill Barr have yet to be made to account for so much of what they did wrong. And, you know, if you ask me, do I believe Bill Barr will ever be held to account? I, I'm not sure uh, that he will be. There doesn't seem to be an appetite in um, in the Department of Justice at this moment to hold accountable what I often refer to as the ruling class criminals. Mm -hmm. We don't do a very good job. You know what? You, you jack a car, you snatch a purse, oh, we're pretty good at going after you. But if you're a ruling class criminal and you abuse wide swaths of the American population, I don't care if you're a ruling class criminal in politics, in big oil, in big pharma, in the military industrial complex, in big tech, we let people get away with murder, figuratively and sometimes literally. And you know what the ruling class criminals do? They get fined or they pay penalties mm -hmm. or they pay back taxes. And what that does is it allows them to factor their own misconduct, inc including criminal misconduct, into their operating budget. And they just keep on criming. I wonder if we will ever wake up to the, the fact that equal justice for all should mean something. And it should mean we don't only go after the purse snatchers and the carjackers and the people who shoplift a stick of deodorant from CVS, 
but it means that we should go after the ruling class criminals who do far more damage than the the low level everyday chronic offenses that mm -hmm. are basically we know this a product of mental health problems drug addiction homelessness joblessness lack of opportunity lack of education you know but these folks were happy to keep churning through the system so yeah there's there's a lot there's a lot that we need to reform yeah and donald trump takes advantage of it he knows that everybody feels very similar to what you just said that you know they get away with murder and you know the rest of us it's it is a two-tier system of justice so he plays to that even though he is at the top of the two-tier system of justice though finally right now it looks like he is going to be held accountable uh you certainly believe it in the upcoming case but i want to ask you this then the special grand jury recommended that mike flynn and lindsey graham be indicted in the georgia case but neither of them were is it possible that they can still be indicted at a later date or did they somehow manage to dodge the bullet you know it's entirely possible you know the the calculation that Fawny willis had to make is okay i've got this special grand jury recommendation how many of these people do i believe should be indicted and the key question there is a grand jury can see the evidence of probable cause one way but the prosecutors have to look at the evidence against a person that they recommended be indicted and assess do i believe i can meet the burden of proving guilt beyond a reasonable doubt one thing i will say there's an enormous chasm between probable cause and proof beyond a reasonable mm -hmm. doubt so i believe listen i think D.A. Willis's decisions have been vindicated at every turn thus far, and I continue to have faith and confidence in her and her team. So I have to believe she made the right decisions when she was trying to decide who among all the people the special purpose grand jury recommended should be indicted, who should we actually indict. But here's the thing. You could absolutely see more indictments down the road, either superseding or separate independent mm -hmm. indictments of other players. There's that, the door is not closed on that. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Look, I am now engaged in litigation and trials and depositions, and it is stressful. Trust me, I know stress. So it's the end of the year and everything's winding down. But really, it feels like life is just getting crazier. It sometimes makes you feel, I mean, more anxious and depressed. So putting something new in your life, it can really make a difference. I mean, shift things like better health. Therapy can make it brighter amid all of the stress and the change. Something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded on top of things and to give you the tools to manage everything that's going on. Therapy can really empower you to be the best version of yourself. And it's not just for those who've experienced major trauma. I mean, literally, literally, everyday life can be challenging. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, try BetterHelp. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient and easy. Just go and fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Cohen today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Cohen. Well, then let me ask you this one then. What do you think about Trump wanting cameras in the courtroom in the election fraud case? Is he using it to attack the process or do you think that he really wants the world to see him lose in court? I don't think I think Donald Trump and his lawyers know that the federal judiciary will not bend and make an exception and allow cameras in the federal courtroom. I think that's dead wrong. I think we should have cameras in the federal courtroom um, now more than ever. I mean, we live stream Supreme Court arguments for goodness sake. Why can't we at least live stream? And I suggest broadcast trials. But here's the thing. I think Trump made the calculation and his lawyers made the calculation that 
cameras are not coming into the federal courtroom. So what does he do? He asks for them to be in the federal courtroom so he can yell and scream when they're not allowed in the federal courtroom that you see, I wanted everybody to see the witch hunt. I wanted everybody to see the evidence that would have proved this was all election interference, but no, they wouldn't put cameras in the courtroom. I think that's the calculation he made. Here's the other thing, Mike, when I read that four and a half page motion, cameras in the courtroom motion from the defense, in my 30 years as a prosecutor, probably the most unprofessional and irresponsible four and a half pages I've ever read in a court filing, because the whole thing, it's not a legal pleading. It is like an extended post at 2 a.m. that you might see Donald Trump actually put on his third rate social media platform, or it looks like it was written by a public relations flack or an assistant campaign manager, right? What Donald Trump and his lawyers do in that four and a half pages is they attack viciously the, the judge. They attack the prosecutors. They attack Joe Biden. I believe the calculation for Donald Trump now is, look, I know I can't win on the evidence in court, right? If he believed he had a righteous defense and he could win on the evidence, he'd be playing this a whole different way. He knows he's going to be convicted in Washington, D.C. So he has to try to undermine the process and the people who populate it. So when, when there is a guilty verdict returned by that jury, he can say, you see, I've been saying all along the process is rigged against me. So I think he's abandoned any pretense of a factual defense on the evidence or the law, and all he's going to do is attack the process and the people who populate it. Well, isn't he doing the same thing in this case with uh, the New York Attorney General, with Judge Ngoron? Attacks the judge. Attacks the judge's yep. law clerk. Gets put onto the stand, under oath, lies, and says that he yep. was talking about me when everybody, including the judge, knew he was talking about the law clerk, the judge because he himself, never wants to call your name. He never wants to call right, your name yeah, out. So right, I'm sure that forbid. come on, really, right? And then he turns around and he lies. What about a perjury charge against that scumbag? What about the fact that Don turns around and makes the claim that he was merely a broker? He doesn't know. Eric claims that he merely poured concrete. Ivanka claimed that she never had anything to do with this, and they start handing out to her email after email after email after email after email. Uh, Miss Trump, uh, who sent this email? I did. And who'd you send it to, right? And did you receive an email back? That's the next document. And did you then respond back? I mean, and this goes on and on and on, 30, 40 documents. I mean, what about you want to talk about perjury? Why why is there no action? Why is it only the Republicans keep doing all of these these actions that sort of in they permit Donald to keep on this path of destroying justice, destroying the system. Most people, if you ask them right now, and it was done in a poll, have turned around and said that they don't trust the DOJ. Let me be very clear. I don't trust the DOJ either based upon my personal experience. Now, I'm not referring to Merrick Garland. I think Merrick Garland, unfortunately, we needed somebody who is less Merrick Garland, certainly not Bill Barr, but somewhere in the middle that would be much more aggressive against you know the GOP, against Donald, Bill Barr, Dan Scavino uh, and others who just refuse, you know, to adhere to subpoenas. I just don't understand why are we doing nothing? How are we going to ever restore the faith in the DOJ the way that Donald keeps doing the things that he's doing, attacking the process day in, day out, day in and day out? Yeah. So one of the things that gives me some comfort is with Donald Trump facing 91 felony charges across four jurisdictions, he's being prosecuted up and down the eastern seaboard. He will be convicted in courtroom after courtroom after courtroom. He will receive what is tantamount to several life sentences. And you can only 
conv- you can only confine a man for but one life. So when you ask the question, well, what about a perjury charge in New York because he lied and said he was talking about you, which doesn't make any sense to any thinking person, right? Um, you can only confine a man for but one life. And I think we have to keep our eyes on the prize, and the prize is holding Donald Trump accountable for trying to bring an end to our democracy, trying to override and overturn the expressed will of the American voters and keep himself installed in power criminally for a second term. That's the prize. Um, all of the other cases will get tried eventually. He will be convicted if he opts not to start entering into some kind of agreements, because once he's convicted in that first case, and I do believe not only that he'll be convicted pretty easily on the evidence in the D.C. case, I believe Judge Chutkin will uh, sentence him to a lengthy prison term, and I do not believe she will leave him on release pending trial. So he will actually see the inside of a jail cell. There's an off chance he sees it before the trial if this gag order gets put back in place and he keeps endangering the witnesses, the court staff, the prosecutors, the, ju- the, the jurors and everybody else involved in the endeavor to try to hold him accountable for his crimes. But so after that, like I, I try not to get all wrapped around the axle over Judge Cannon and the way she continues to show her lack of impartiality and her poor judicial temperament and her lack of understanding of, you know, what a judge is supposed to be all about. That case may, you know, suffer the death of a thousand continuances, but I'm less concerned about that. It's important if we have high government officials violating our nation's espionage laws, which are some of the charges against Donald Trump, it's important and we have to get around to prosecuting it, but it will all begin to melt away and be of less concern once Donald Trump is convicted in the first criminal case including charges like perjury that could otherwise have been brought. Hey, Glenn, let me ask you a question. Something just popped into my head. What was the deal with his lawyers deciding to withdraw their appeal? Did you, you, did you hear about that? On, on which issue? I, I was going to actually ask you. I just saw somewhere flash across the television screen that he was on, on appeal and he ended up, his lawyers decided to drop the appeal before the decision even came out. To me, I just didn't understand it. But you know what? I have a vague recollection of that. That was some, some weeks back, maybe? Or, so, or is it a new, a new one? No, I think it was new. Uh, you know what? I'll, new? I'll, get to, I'll get to that before, hopefully, okay. the end of the show. But let me then well, ask- let me tell you, I've, I've, seen other, I've had defendants who withdrew their appeals after they'd been filed, and it was because they thought there was going to be a really bad decision handed down against them, uh-huh. and they didn't want to have to suffer that. So- and that's not unprecedented, even though it's a little unusual. Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So it's actually the case that I'm involved with. So Trump drops the appeal to move the Stormy Daniels hush money case uh, to federal court. He wanted to have it removed from state court to federal court. And for obvious reasons, because his feeling is if he wins the election, he could pardon himself. But you can't pardon yourself for a state crime. Correct. Even, but even if a state prosecution gets removed to federal court, like they're also trying to do down in Georgia unsuccessfully thus far, even if it gets, even if the removal motion gets granted and the case gets tried in federal court, guess what? It's still a state court conviction. So you can't pardon, a president can't pardon himself or anybody else if a state court case gets removed to federal court. It does not magically convert it to a federal court conviction. It's a state court case that gets tried in the federal court. Interesting. So look, you were on uh, the other day with my dear friend, and she's actually going to be my guest on December 9th. I'm going to do a mea culpa uh, live with Katie Fang. And she's the best. I love Katie. And you were talking about Trump's various trials, the subject of Trump's defenses and the Chutkin trial also came up when you were just talking about. Now, apparently, Donald has until mid-January to figure out if he's going to use the advice of counsel defense. Do you think that he plans to throw one or more of his lawyers under the bus I'm certain he'll throw anyone, including his kids, which is something that I said to Katie. I can't understand why he let them t- 
take the uh, stand again. Don Jr. was number one uh, when it came to the defense list. I think it's a terrible move. But do you think that he's going to throw one or more of his lawyers under the bus? And who do you think it'll be? Oh, I think he'll throw everybody under the bus if he thinks it's in his interest to do it. I don't think he's going to end up going with an advice of counsel defense, but it really doesn't matter if he does one way or another. If he does, the consequences are the attorney-client privilege evaporates and everything his attorneys said to him and everything he said to his attorneys will now be fair game for Jack Smith and can be used against him at trial. But here's the thing. Here's the reason the advice of counsel dog won't hunt for Donald Trump. First of all, we have seen the reporting about how Jack Smith was investigating Rudy Giuliani for potentially being intoxicated, drunk, on and around January 6th when he was giving Donald Trump legal advice. One, there is no such thing as advice of drunk counsel defense. That won't work. Two, Donald Trump told Kristen Welker, I didn't really listen to my lawyers. I listened to my own instincts. Guess what? There is no advice of your own instincts defense. That's that's number two. Number three, um, so many of Donald Trump's lawyers are his partners in crime. They're his co-defendants. They're his co-conspirators in Georgia. So many of them have pleaded guilty already. And if if uh, advice of drunk counsel is bad and advice of my own instincts is bad probably the worst defense of all is advice of my co-conspirators defense there is no such thing anywhere donald trump turns he loses so i don't think he'll formally try to assert an advice of counsel defense but if he do it will be a dead loser and if he does it'll be in his mind what he'll do is he'll just do what he did to me all he'll do is just constantly have everybody keep repeating liar 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 can you know uh trying to get himself a better deal and and i mean he and they it just gets parroted over and over and over again but Klein, did judge cannon's ruling to keep trump's 2024 trial date in may of 2024 has she come to her senses or is she just playing Trump's game? Because Cannon also regularly shows contempt for Jack Smith. I mean, I find it fucking fascinating, to be honest with you. Not just fascinating, but I find it disgraceful. Is this common for a judge to publicly denigrate a prosecutor, especially one in such a high-profile case? Yeah, no, I, you know, when I read... Judge Cannon's ruling, it was, I think, two rulings ago. I counted nine times where she just gratuitously criticized um, in a way that shows a real lack of judicial temperament, gratuitously criticized Jack Smith and his prosecutors over and over and over again, continuing to show her lack of impartiality. But then in the most recent order, when she continued a full dozen deadlines, pushed them all down the road. But in the next breath, she said, I am not going to continue the May trial date yet. What she ultimately said is I want all of the parties back in my Florida courtroom on March 1st. And that's when we'll decide if we're going to continue the May trial date or not. Now, that is actually a legitimate way to go about deciding whether the May trial date should stick or not. I don't believe it will stick. I don't believe Judge Cannon has any intent to make it stick. But here's the thing. On March 1st, we're going to know whether Donald Trump's criminal trial in Washington, D.C. will start three days later on March 4th. And if it will, then I think the May trial date of necessity gets continued because Donald Trump and his lawyers will be in trial in Washington, D.C., probably for a couple of months, bumping right up against the May trial date. Under any circumstances, with any run-of-the-mill litigant or defendant, that trial date is going to get continued because I actually, yeah, I think it would be unfair to keep a defendant in trial for a couple of months and his lawyers in trial for a couple of months unable to focus on the May trial date and then make them start a May trial date. I wouldn't 
I wouldn't feel comfortable with that as a prosecutor advocating for that. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't feel comfortable with it as just a civilian. But the problem is that Trump can't, no matter how hard he tries, he just cannot stop saying defamatory and violent things against Judge Angoron, against Judge Chutkin, against DA mm -hmm. Fonnie Willis, against Tish James, against, um, what do you call it, uh, Jack Smith, against Alvin Bragg, anyone and everyone prosecuting him, testifying against him, myself included. And this violent, this violent language that he throws out, the defamatory and violent um, language has real repercussions. I mean, I, I got just the other day, somebody on social media writes comments, and it was about a post that I put up talking about how Donald speaks like a mob boss, that there's a distinction between explicit and implied. And that's the why, of course, I believe that this referral to the DOJ is baseless. And I also feel that both Turner and also Stefanik should be um, censored for, for what they did. It's a horrible, horrible thing that they're doing. But this is the response that somebody put up there. A Jew felon talking like a member of the mob. This dude is hilarious. This is the kind of shit that Donald evokes in his supporters. It's what he wants to evoke. Now, yeah. despite all of the warnings, he's not paid any attention. And I know the guy well. He has not paid an iota of attention to gag orders. So my question to you, and it's not one that he's already violated. It's at least two, if not more, even though the judge has only held him in contempt for two. Why isn't he on pretrial detention based on his behavior and this dangerous rhetoric? What are they, what are they going to wait for? For somebody to get hurt? Well, people got hurt at the Capitol on January 6th, and he wasn't held accountable for any of that in a timely manner. So I cannot uh, explain the inexplicable. Michael, I have been arguing for a very long time that because the evidence shows clearly and convincingly, that is the evidentiary standard, that Donald Trump is a danger to the community, to society, and to our very democracy, he should be detained pending trial. That's what the law provides. When Judge Chutkin said, I was in her courtroom when they were arguing the gag order issue, when Judge Chutkin said, if any other defendant said that the prosecutor handling his case was a deranged thug, that person would be in pretrial detention. The only reason he's not is because the prosecutors have not asked that he be put in pretrial detention, that he be, de be detained pending trial or that he be revoked on release. And I don't know why, I, I don't know why that is, because an application of the facts and the law would result in him being detained pending trial. But prosecutors have decided that they would take extraneous factors into account and decline to ask that the single most dangerous defendant on pretrial release in this country, they would decline to ask that he be detained pending trial. I don't have an explanation for that. Neither it's not I. what I would have done if I was involved in the prosecution of Donald Trump. So then, look, let, let me just shift gears for a quick second. Steve Bannon goes to trial next year in the Save the Wall scheme, and he's charged with money laundering, conspiracy, and fraud. He's also appealing a contempt of court case this week, I believe. But what's going to take to get some of these big fish fuckers finally put away? I, I, I truly don't get it. And do you think that a few convictions will start changing the hearts and minds of these MAGA voters? I don't know if it will or not, and it doesn't matter to me. You know, we can't decline to do the right thing for fear or concern about how the wrong people will react, right? People say, well, if you can find Donald Trump, you're giving him what he wants. He'll go up in the polls. There might be some violence by his supporters, to which I say, I don't care. Now, I'm not being cavalier about violence, right? I fought against violence my whole career as a prosecutor, but I don't care what the extraneous factors 
or consequences are of an honest application of the law to the facts. I don't care because once you start caring and making your decisions Mm -hmm. based on those extraneous factors, you end up precisely where we are right now in a democracy on fire, in a circumstance where the end is as of yet unwritten with a presidential candidate who has not been held accountable, who is now pledging to do things like cancel the Constitution and deploy the military against the citizenry and go after his enemies using the Department of Justice or just put them in mental institutions, which was his latest rant. And we haven't held him accountable for his crimes. We haven't taken away his megaphone by detaining him pending trial because he's a danger to the community. And this is why we are precisely where we are. It's a failing of the rule of law. It's a failing of the institutions of government. And I can only hope we wise up and we prod the rule of law into wakefulness and apply it as it was intended to be applied. Because if we don't, we are in real trouble. So what, if anything, do you do you think? will ultimately send Donald to jail. I mean, which case do you think? I know that you said that you know he's going to be held, and I believe the same thing, that he's going to be held accountable for all 91 charges. I really do. I think that they have him on all of it. But which one do you think is the first to finally get him locked up? Or is it, as some would say, especially on the left, Is it just wishful thinking that justice will someday prevail? Yeah, I I don't think it's wishful thinking. I think accountability is coming for Donald Trump. I think it will begin actually on February 9. That's when the jurors are being brought into court in Washington, D.C. to begin filling out jury questionnaires Mm -hmm. in preparation for jury selection, which will begin on March 4th. Judge Tanya Chutkin is presiding over that case. I tried murder cases against Tanya Chutkin when she was a public defender in Washington, D.C., and I was a federal homicide prosecutor in D.C. She is strong, smart, tough, principled, trustworthy, which I don't say about every defense attorney. I say it about many because I had great experiences and relationships with many. And then I've watched her in court in the years since she left the public defender service. She has all those same qualities. And I've said it before. Judge Chutkin don't play. And when she said, and I quote, our trial date, March 4, will not yield to an election cycle, and we will not revisit the trial date in this case, I believe her. I take that to the bank, and Donald Trump will be tried, convicted, and a sentence of incarceration will be handed down by Judge Chutkin, I believe. And I think he's going to prison behind that case. I really do. Do you actually think, you know, look, because the hour goes by real quick. So the last sort of topic that I just want to bring up, do you actually think that they'll put him behind bars or do you think it's going to be a very significant or very severe type of a home confinement? No internet. He's not going to be going playing golf. You know, okay, maybe he'll have food brought in, um, but he will be treated like a prisoner, but it will be in one of his properties and not Mar-a-Lago. It would have to be its own freestanding property. And he has like two houses or three houses across the street, one of which was his sister, uh, Judge Barry, who just passed away. He bought that house. They could easily turn that into a home confinement scenario because me personally, and I said it on TV the other day, I would be very concerned for America's national security if Donald was in a prison situation, not that the sight or the thought of it with the clinking doors that stays in your head forever, you know, and the sound of the keys jingling, you know, while you're trying to sleep as the correctional officers walk past you at night, flashing lights in your eyes. The fact that that's even a possibility makes me smile. However, I'm more concerned about America and the national security secrets that he has in his head, including national security secrets that he's already shown people. That's already been, I mean, he showed it to that Australian billionaire over at Mar-a-Lago. He showed it to individuals in the library over at Mar-a-Lago or in his study, whatever you call that place. I'm afraid that he will disclose information 
that should not be disclosed. And then the last part of that question, if he does end up in a facility, does he get Secret Service protection there? So first of all, um, somebody who tried to overturn American democracy needs to be punished. Any future aspiring dictator needs to be deterred from trying it all over again. That's why Donald Trump needs to go to prison for what he did. Not home confinement, which is like sentencing somebody to binge watch Netflix and order DoorDash. That will not deter tomorrow's aspiring dictators. And they are out there, right? The whole Republican Party, not the whole. There have but been he, a couple of But in all fairness, Glenn, he gets a little bit of a pass yeah. because the aspiring dictator doesn't and was not briefed for four straight years on national security information. So there's a big difference. So, but, but, but if that gives him a pass, what we are saying is that we can never, ever punish uh, a former president. He's already compromised our national security mm -hmm. in a thousand ways. I'm more concerned about preserving American democracy and doing everything we can to deter tomorrow's dictator, aspiring dictator, wannabe autocrat like Donald Trump from doing it all over again. If, if Donald Trump gets to hold hostage whatever national security secrets he may still have that he hasn't yet divulged and use that as a get out of free jail card, well, then guess what? There's no hope for American democracy. He needs to go to prison. He needs to be punished. We need to deter tomorrow's an aspiring dictator. And he can go to prison. You know how many protected witnesses, including in RICO prosecutions, we successfully confined while they were cooperating? It is not hard to do. Does there he get Secret satellite... Service protection? No, I don't believe so. And here's why. I've talked to some people, not in the Secret Service, but former Bureau of Prisons folks and former U.S. Marshals. And the U.S. Marshal Service runs the long-term witness security program outside of the prison system and inside of the prison system. So I think they will enter into a memorandum of, of understanding with the BOP and the U.S. Marshal Service. And the Secret Service will relinquish the, their protective uh, services. That's that's our best guess. Talking about people who are, who used to be inside the system, but it doesn't matter. That's a minor detail that can be worked out, even by statute, if need be. Of course, passing new laws in this Republican clown show is is not really in the cards. But he has to go to prison if we care about democracy and the future of it. He has to go to prison for his democracy busting crimes. That's the only way to deter tomorrow's aspiring dictator. And you know why? You know why, Glenn? I do know why. Because justice matters. That's very catchy. That's what I was thinking. Exactly. Glenn, <laughs> thank you so much, my friend. Truly appreciate you. Thanks, Michael. I'll see you soon.